Hello, my name is John Brink and we are on the brink podcasting from beautiful Prince George, Northern British Columbia. It's a beautiful day in Prince George. It's the 22nd of March. Two days, um, it, yeah, I believe it's 22nd. Uh, spring is around the corner and uh, we, today we have a fabulous lady, uh, Mattia Tiana. Did I say that correctly? Tiani. 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 Uh, yeah. Welcome to the show, uh, Mattia. So, uh, you have an interesting background because uh, you're quite into sports and then other things that you do as well. But tell me a little bit about your background. Where, were you born here or what is your, where did you kind of originate? Okay, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to sit down with you. Um, I was born in a small little village in um, Bosnia-Herzegovina, which was at the time a province of Croatia. Right. I was born in the same farmhouse as my dad. Okay. And um, Was that during the time there was a lot of issues? There was not, not at that time. So I was yeah. born um, in 1969. Okay. Yeah, so it was, it was at peace then. They were actually part of Yugoslavia at that time, so yeah. they had not actually started with the the freedom and breaking free from that whole system. Right. But um, yeah, so I was, I was born there and my mom and I stayed there when my dad went, he went back to Canada because he had previously been in Canada, got his Canadian citizenship. And then... Was he born there as well? Yes, he was born there as yeah. well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. he moved to Canada seven years prior to meeting to my mom. To get a job. To get a job, to get himself settled. Was, was that the whole to... idea? of? But I remember I, I left Holland in 1965 to come here mm -hmm. on my own. Before yes. that, a lot of people that we knew or family that we had post-Second World War, mm -hmm. uh, you know, left there to build a new career after leaving a troubled Europe uh, in a lot of ways and what happened would uh, would happen a lot of times is they left first to find a job get mm -hmm. settled and then bring the rest of the family over yes that's exactly what happened in my dad's case as well okay. so okay. he came here and he actually stayed here for the seven years because at that time you had to be here seven years in order to did he come uh, to Prince George? Uh, he came to Ottawa first. Oh, yeah. And then um, there was a lot of job opportunity in Prince George. Yeah. So he came here and... How did he get to... From Ottawa to Prince George? Oh, that's Ottawa, a, that's he a... was brought in by a church there. And he had okay. a priest that he always talks about that helped him out and got him going. And then he had some friends that had come here yeah, as yeah. well at yeah. that time. And they were just encouraging him to come up and, and give it a try. And yeah, yeah. there was a lot of job opportunity at that time. It was starting off when in, in mills in 1969. Yeah, so 1960. Yeah, same well, time. Well, actually, sorry, that's when I was born. So he was actually here in 1963. Yeah. So that's, so that's when this, that's the it period started to, to that build. a lot was happening in Prince George because mm -hmm. I came here in 1965. Yes. And it was sitting in Prince George for uh, our international viewers and the ones that are not familiar with it uh, prince george is in central british columbia yes and uh you know it's a, uh, a city really uh, that is quite developed it's universities colleges yes and uh, a beautiful city to uh, to live in and bring up a family but in the mid 60s early 60s it was considered to be and be sitting right in the middle of Prince George where there was lots of activity. Yes. And the normal conversation would be if you met somebody in Prince George, you would say, where are you from? Mm -hmm. and, and when did you get here? And when are you leaving? Because yeah. it was a place where you could make money, but you wouldn't stay you here. You wouldn't stay. It was a that's boom exactly town. exactly it. Yeah. And yeah. that's like, I remember my dad explaining it to us like that too. Yeah. But he loved it and built a home here and brought my mom and I over and the rest is... Are you the just, only sibling then? No, I have a brother. So yeah. my brother, uh, he was born here though. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, and, and so what, and so you were, you, you, you came over and then you got educated here. I did. And, yes, I and, did. And then, uh, were you already in school? Uh, no, I wasn't. So I was just a year old when I came here. Yeah. Um, so allowed you to adjust. It did, absolutely yeah. adjust. Even though that when I did actually enter a school because, you know, the parents didn't have the language, nor did they right. have the means. They didn't have a lot of people other than the people that they knew in their community of 
you know, Croatian people or, or yeah, other yeah. Europeans. Yeah. And I couldn't speak a word of English when I went to kindergarten. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that changed quickly. Yeah. So as soon as you're, you know, interacting and stuff. And especially when of, you're totally immersed. Especially emerged, when, yeah, right? exactly. And yeah. my mom said within a month I was, already. I was just already speaking and. Yeah. Um, I remember becoming a Canadian citizen because I was seven, I was seven, eight years old. I was in grade two and yeah. I went down to Sidley Hall and did my pledge and yeah, that's I was very a, proud of that. Yeah. And me too. You yeah. Know, I was because very I, proud of that. I did the same when I came, I was Dutch obviously. And then, uh, you know, the, uh, I became a Canadian citizen, I think in the early eighties and, uh, you know, it was quite an experience because it was, you know, fairly major and, uh, I always wanted to go to Canada when I was born. We were liberated by the Canadians mm -hmm. in 1945. Mm -hmm. I was born in 1940. And, uh, you know, so, uh, and uh, I always had the dream of going to Canada. I, I called it the land of my heroes. And uh, so I already knew from the time I was five years old, I would go that to Canada. That you were going to Canada. Yeah. 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 yeah, I remember my dad speaking about it too. And they were, they had different options, but many people went to either Australia the United States or Canada, but he said he was just drawn to the name. He was drawn to the name of Canada and something just told him that Interesting, that's yeah? just where he needed to go. And yeah, yeah to this day, he's like, um, the reason he is where he is and has the opportunities he has and the opportunities we have is because, you know, Canada gave it to him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and then, so you then started to get educated here and then how did that all go? You want to school you went to high school then from there and then what did you do next yeah i went to high school and then i um went to simon fraser university and i um got a degree in child care so i did a little bit of that for for some time and that's in vancouver right yeah yeah, yeah in vancouver and then um i moved back here to prince george I've always loved Prince George. I know yeah. some people say, but I mean, it was born and bred. It's my home. I love it. Yeah. So I came back here when I was done and I did a little bit of work in that field. And um, yeah, and then as time went on, I met my husband and got married and moved on. And here we are. Yeah. yeah. And, and then the other thing that you have done, you, you've always been in, into sports of some sort. Yes. In particular running and... Particularly running. So, yeah. um, like my entire life, I was always, you know, mindful, healthy, healthy living and, yeah. and working out and stuff. Yeah. And then uh, nine years ago, I was honestly a closet smoker. Yeah. And nine years ago, I just something, I had an, an epiphany as they call it, but it was just a moment where I was like sitting there thinking to myself, I was amongst a whole bunch of people and I just was like, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I don't want to be this. First of all, I'm hiding it for one. So that means obviously I'm not proud of it. Yeah. And I took up running. So that was sort of how I first got into running. So, I, so up to that point you were i was working out taking care of myself in a healthy lifestyle but then also you know doing that like having that bad habit yeah I, yeah for a lot of people difficult to stop it right? is it is so but i they, just they need some kind of a shock of some sort yes uh, yeah like, uh, i just decided and i just when I want something, my husband will always say that to me. He goes, I love and hate the same things about you because when you want something, you get it. You right. go out, you get it, you make it happen. You, you, that kind yeah, of personality. Yeah, so that's yeah. just my personality, right? Yeah. I'm just, I can, you know, be determined and disciplined yeah. to do it. And I just decided that that wasn't going to be for me anymore. Yeah. And I switched my habit to running. Yeah. And I did running for a while. I, d I ran, sorry. And then I just dabbled a little bit in um, obstacle racing. So I did some Spartan um obstacle racing and some but tough mutter racing uh it's just like <laughs> it's you're do going doing obstacles and running at the same time so there's um you can do like there's monkey bars there's um log carrying oh, there's and you run in between so there's like obstacles you run in between the obstacles you do the obstacles and then you make your you way climb to the over it or you do climb something ropes you climb walls stuff like that is that very popular uh, it was before it was like Spartan, the Spartan racing, um, specifically is, um, a sanctioned race. So right. it's, it's based on time and you know, yeah, there's yeah. championships and stuff. Uh, the Tough Mudder is just, um, it's just a fun 
event. Yeah. yeah. So that it's along the same lines, but just not sanctioned as an actual. So then, uh, you know, but already you were into fitness, but then, I was. then you started building on the running. And yeah, particular. I did. And I even tried my little thing at um, powerlifting. I did a meet down at X conditioning. I tried okay. that. And all it, it, throughout all that time, I was still running. So yeah. I was still like, kept my running going. Nothing serious, not, you know. And then I thought, oh, maybe I should try a marathon. Yeah. You know, give it a try. And um, I ran my first marathon. My first road marathon was the BMO in Vancouver. Yeah. And um, I had is no expectation. Is that a full marathon? Yes, it is. So it's 42.2 kilometers. Yeah. I didn't have any... I didn't have any expectations of it other than to finish. Yeah. So that was good. I, it was tough though. It was tough. The last 10 kilometers of that race is on well, the seawall. Yeah. And there was times where I would be looking down at my legs to make sure I was still moving. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, um, but I finished it and it was great. And I was, when I finished, I'll be honest, I was like, I'm never doing that again. Every bone in my body hurt. Yeah. And I thought, I don't want to do that again. Yeah. And as a little bit of time went on, I just, I thought I need to, I need to do that. I enjoy, I love that distance. I love the 42 kilometers. Yeah. So I knew in my mind, like Why? mentally. Because it puts you up against the limit in a lot of it ways. It does. And at each mark. So, you, you, you know, feel... you get to your 10 K and your half and your 26, which is usually my tough spot. Yeah. You, would, and you, you know exactly know, when yeah. your body says, uh, and, and then you start saying to yourself, maybe I should stop. But you can't. But you and can't. now you have to keep going. And, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So mentally, I knew like I could, you could that do it. portion I could do. Yeah. And the distance is the distance. So for a yeah. marathon, it's always the same. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And I thought, well, what I need to do is train properly because I had just come off doing like a powerlifting meet. Yeah, and yeah. That. And so I just started, you know, focusing more on training properly and, and doing it. And, you know, now I'm at. This was this past December was my eleventh marathon. marathon. Yeah. So, what do you do about training for, you know, the obviously you're a, a well-skilled uh, marathon runner. What do you do about your training uh, in between marathons, or you constantly train and keep yourself in shape? I do. Um, so I have a coach. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that was one of the things that was the big game changer for me. Was I went and hired a coach yeah and always not always I've had a coach now for two years yeah yeah so definitely um, since those two years I my game has changed as far as um, becoming competitive yeah. and becoming um, considered elite in my age group yeah. and just being able to to grow and to have that support to have that accountability yeah you know what that's like right I, I do. Because, yeah, you uh, do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, you know, the, uh, I've, I've been competitive bodybuilder. Uh, yes. You know, and uh, competed uh, uh, in the, in the uh, first in the region, then in the pro province, then on the national level, mm -hmm. qualified for the nationals, and then qualified for the Arnolds. And then, uh, then COVID came, mm -hmm. and I just started training again two weeks ago, actually. Uh, you know, and I want yes, to start. Yes, I know. I've been following you. Yeah, have yes, you? Yeah. I have. You're so going I, with Kendall. I, I want to compete again in 23. Okay. And, uh, and I think right now I'm probably the oldest competitive bodybuilder in the province. Nice. I'm 81 and a half. So by, by then I will be 83 when I'm competing. And mm -hmm. I hope to compete again on the regional level, then provincial, then national, and the Arnolds. Excellent. Yeah, and uh, and I do the same. I was going to ask you the question, but I'm going to tell you mine. Sure. And yours is very similar, likely, sure. is that, so how do you do that, John? Well, I have a trainer. Mm -hmm. Because if I don't have a trainer, then I can find a hundred reasons as to why I can't go that day. And this way it makes, for me, it's a commitment. And, uh, you know, and so that's what I do. And, uh, and then I have the best one, you know, so, uh, you know, the, uh, so I have a very, very good trainer that uh, I work with and, uh, you know, so, uh, and then that gets me to my appointments and then, uh, you know, the, uh, so I'm going to just take it forward, you know, so, but the reason for the trainer is simply to create that discipline and uh, make sure that I do the right things at the right time. And uh, 
you know, and gradually work up to wherever the goal is, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's like I said, you know, it's, and like you're saying as well, you know, it's that accountability, it's yeah. the support, it's trusting the process, Yeah. you know, trusting someone else, and then in turn, you're trusting yourself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and just, um, it's hard to do it on your own. I don't know. Like, yeah. I think for some people it might be, but I like it, and I like the support, and it just helped me, and it encouraged me too, and moving forward was I got my coaching certification. So yeah. now I'm able to um, coach others if you so others. wish. Yeah, yeah, and give back to that, yeah. right? Yeah. But still so. you're doing your own getting a coach. Oh yeah, yeah. I will never give up my coach. No, and, yeah. and I feel exactly the same yeah. as you do about it. And that's the same reasons the way you do it, I do it as well. Yeah, and, and, I, the, and I wanna be that coach for people. Yeah. I would never give mine up. I mean, I think it's, it's a game changer. It's a yeah. game changer for anybody that wants to step up to that to that next level, whatever your next level is, right? Right. Right. We all have our own. Exactly. Yeah. So, so now, as you look forward for the year, so you you've done the Boston Marathon. I yes, I did Boston Marathon in two thousand and nineteen. Now, if you do the Boston Marathon, you have to qualify for that, right? Yes, you do. You cannot just say, okay, I'm going to do it. No, you have to be qualified. Yes. So it, it's one of the uh, six world majors. So right. you have to qualify for those. Right. Uh, Boston in particular, and it's a time qualifier. And there's um, also one in New York. Yes, there's New York. There's yeah. Boston, New York, uh, Tokyo, London. Amsterdam? Uh, no. Okay. No. Um, I lost Chicago. Okay. And did I miss one? Yeah. So, so, so that's your goal then that you kind of look forward to the next 12 months and saying, I'm planning to train and then do you schedule your marathons that you want to run? Um, yes, I usually do. Like I'll pick one. Like, so this going forward this year on May 1st, I'm going to be running, uh, the BMO, which is in Vancouver. Okay. Yeah. The Bank of Montreal marathon. Yeah. And then I made it into Chicago marathon, which is another one of the world majors. Yeah. Yeah. And that's in October. In October. Yes. So those are the two that you kind of. Yeah. Those are, planning. those are my two for now. Yeah. I will be running a half marathon at the end of May in Calgary. Yeah, yeah. And and your training you do all the time. Yeah, I do all the time. I mean, yeah. you know, you pull back obviously when yeah, yeah. you're not in the season, like in the winter months, you're going to pull back some. Yeah. Um, spring marathons aren't always the greatest because uh, being in Prince George, you know, there's the weather conditions and Correct. stuff. So yeah. I choose not to participate in marathons usually early spring, just yeah. because um, it's harder training, yeah, training yeah. wise. Yeah, yeah. Um, but otherwise, yeah. And then that's kind of like my downtime. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, of course, you know, with when you say, when you've got the proper trainer and stuff, yeah. you know, they know when to pull you back, yeah. even in between your, and then you just fire up again and, yeah. Yeah. Now, the other things that you do is uh, you're quite involved and in, uh, you're an assistant teacher or... Uh, yes. So what, uh, tell us a little bit about what you do there. Yes, I work as an educational assistant. I work part-time as an educational assistant. What is and an educational assistant? You support you support children and um, teachers in the classroom. Okay. I've been doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one with autistic children. Art and especially autistic? Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yeah. Been working specifically with them. And um, I know we partnered, you partnered with me in the past with your yeah. support yeah. Uh, in doing some of the fundraising yes. that I did for autism there yeah, in, yeah. last year. And then again um, in 2020 when... Yeah, we've been a couple of times yeah, involved. We've been, in, yeah, so... Yeah, it's very important. Right? Yeah, it so is. For us. Yeah, yeah, it is. And um, So what brought you to that uh, autism in particular? It was just an opportunity that was there right. um, when I was working in the schools. And um, I, I guess, too, is just my relationship with those children and understanding them. Yeah. And um, I love those children. Yeah. And I work with them to try to get them to um, trust me. Yeah. So that's a, that's a big thing Building for me. And once I gain their... Yes. And for them, being able to trust somebody is really important. And yeah. for me to be able to gain their trust is very important. And that's yeah. how we work together and work forward. Yeah. 
So autism, other than the obvious, but uh, it's not all that well understood by a lot of people. Uh, share some of the things about it with us. Well, it's usually, I mean, it's, it's such a broad, it's a, such a broad spectrum and right. um, no one autistic child or person is the same. Right. Um, you know, they, they can be labeled right from like, for example, with ADHD, which I know that you've, you've talked about before. Yeah. So it can be starting just as low as that on the spectrum to fully non-functioning. Yeah. So it's, it's just such a broad spectrum yeah. as far as that goes, but there is a lot of, um, supports. There's a lot of different communities and organizations that help with being able to, um, it not only educate them academically, but socially, because yeah. it is really a social, it's a social disorder, right? Yeah. Like being able to, um, make a, com a connection with another, yeah. another person, another human being. So much and to be able to, you know, grow and foster and, and, and live in society, yeah. you know, to the best of, of, of their ability or whatever is given in that opportunity. Yeah. Like, uh, in particular in the last number of years, you know, the, uh, as you know already from me that, uh, mm -hmm. I was diagnosed, uh, ADHD, uh, you know, when I was virtually in my sixties and, uh, you know, but, and then, uh, you know, the, I, I self-diagnosed initially and, mm -hmm. and struggled through my earlier life as many do mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, was not very good at school. Uh, failed grade three, failed grade seven, three times, on and on and on. Oh. And, <laughs> you know, so, but then there used to be stigma attached yes. to it. And, uh, you know, so uh, be doing, I wrote a book on ADHD. It's coming out July the 8th, actually. Okay. It's called ADHD Unlocked. Okay. And uh, I kind of think it's a, a whole different approach to looking at ADHD. It uh, involves my story, but it also involves about 15 different individuals of all descriptions that tell their story. Okay. And, uh, you know, so I kind of wanted to make it in such a way that it is easy to read for somebody that is ADHD that easily gets distracted if it becomes boring. So Wonderful. kind of keep it uh, in the... So it's coming out on July the 8th, actually. Well, I look forward to that. Uh, pardon me? I look forward to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. We'll make sure you get a copy of okay. it. Okay. Uh, you know, but for most of my life, including, uh, you know, the up to about five, six, seven, eight years ago, there was a lot of stigma attached to any of that, right? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, so there now, it's becoming more accepted and more people have knowledge about it, but there is still stigma. And I felt that, uh, you know, that I had to do a couple of things. I had to, I do a fair amount of, uh, you know, doing uh, presentations. Mm -hmm. I usually talk about it and presentations that I do it. That was not so 10 years ago. No. I was not talking about it at all, actually. And uh, then I felt I had to write about it from a perspective of somebody is ADHD and then combine it in, in a book that will have a whole different uh, uh, approach to writing the book in terms of making it attractive to people that have ADHD. And then the other one is to have a different number of people that uh, explored it or became knowledgeable about their ADHD at an early life and some of them older and what happened to them and how did it affect them and hopefully I believe it will be helpful to people that uh, have loved ones that are affected by it or simply have an interest in it you know so. mm -hmm. have an interest or if it can sort of help them even now if if they haven't been diagnosed or if they don't know or if they think and they're not sure yeah and you know that coming out as like you said that you did at 60 years old yeah you know is can be quite significant and yeah. to remove the stigma, because I think with any disorder, you know, I hate calling it a disorder. I mean, it's it's what makes you who you are. It's yeah. a part of this. You see, I struggled with ADHD disorder. I'm not comfortable with. I don't disorder. like that. I don't no, like that word but, either. But yeah. uh, I will have that in my book as well. Yes. So I call it a superpower. 
Yeah. You know, because oh, yeah. uh, I couldn't do what I was doing uh, unless right. it was me being ADHD. And, yes. uh, so, uh, and, and so uh, the book kind of takes people through it. And uh, the key, in my opinion, no question about it, is that the earlier people are aware of the diagnosis, mm -hmm. uh, that is not a liability, it's not a disease no, that needs to be fixed. No. That's who they are. That's right. And then what you then do is how do you live with it? And not only live with it, but succeed with it, simply accepting that as part of your life and then building your life around it. And, uh, you know, and that's the purpose of the book, really. Yes. And I love that. I love that. Using it as a superpower, using, using it as an asset, using it as a, a quality that you can um, help others too. Yeah. And it's, it's okay. It makes you who you are. That's yeah. what's special about you. That's one of the things that makes you who you are. Yeah. yeah. You see, the other thing that I did, and uh, you know, did you? Did, yes, absolutely. Did, did and I I've give shared you it with a friend? Yeah. Too. Yeah, a couple so, of friends. Yeah. So what I did is, uh, you know, the uh, a couple of years ago, two years ago now, I think, I wrote a book uh, against all odds, mm -hmm. and uh, that includes talking about ADD, PTSD because of the war yes. years, and on and on and on. And, uh, you know, so uh, I always say it took me 80 years to live it, 20 years to think about it, two years to write it. <laughs> right. And it's become very, very popular. It and, sure uh, is. you know, but I wanted to talk about that. The book is not so much about uh, hurrah, hurrah, John, no, but I know. more about saying, even then, with all the challenges, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that includes ADHD, PTSD, inner child, and, and then, then leaving Holland and starting over new and feeling you're a failure, all of that in combination, uh, still being successful and staying the course, you know, that's the purpose of the, bu the book, is mm -hmm. saying that if I can do it, anybody can do it, more or less. And, uh, saying stay the course, never, never give up, you know, so, uh, you know, the, uh, so that's why that book was important to me. Yeah, and I really appreciate that, and it's like you getting to the top of that mountain, but it's that climb, it's that climb that made you. And the falling down. Yeah, and the falling up. down, that's right, because yeah. it's never easy, it's all those steps no. that it takes you to get to the top of that but mountain. But you get stronger all the time, you bet. right? And yeah, stay and that's the what course. makes those strong, stay Don't the course. Don't give up, yep. you know, so. Uh, even yeah. though there is times, I mean, I'm sure, and I know it's happened to you, I know it's happened yes. to me. Yes. And it's easy for us to say, but it's good because people can relate to that. They can relate to you. They can, yeah. you know, like it's, it's not like it was handed to you. You worked hard yeah. every step of the way. Yeah. But now it's time to share, you yeah, know, with right? others, you know. And, and so, that's what I like to do too. I like yeah. to share. Like anything I have, I like to share. I like to do what I can to help others. I like yeah. to do what I can to support others. You know, whether it's the kids in the school or people that are in my community or yeah, whatever opportunity I have, I love to. Yeah, and you know that I do back. the same. Part of our yeah. culture is giving back it for is. one. Yeah. And then the other one is to work with others, you know, that uh, have challenges. And, uh, you know, that's the purpose of the books. And uh, they will not make me a fortune, but, uh, you know, but I love writing I about it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and that's why I wrote the other one. And then do another one following that uh, again. So my objective is to write at least one book a year. Excellent. Yeah, so, yeah. and uh, you know, so the, uh, the first one is uh, July the 8th and then the following July 23 is another book coming out. Wonderful. Yeah. I look forward to them. Yeah, so, uh, so that's what we do. So the, so, so as you then are involved in the school system. Hmm. Which school are you involved with? Sacred Was, Heart School. And, and so tell me a little bit more about it, how that works in the school now compared to the way it used to be. The way it used to be is a lot of times these children, even the young people, including myself, mm -hmm. would be put in the back of the class mm -hmm. and you just kind of, you know. Yeah, so that definitely no longer exists. No. Uh, it's, where it's all about inclusion. Yeah. Because there's no point in putting them off to the side. They're already um, off to the side as yeah. it is to begin with, right? So um, socializing them is just so important. Yeah. And um, they're part of the classroom. Yeah. They're part of the classroom as long as just as much as any other student. Yeah. And um, yeah, there's no more. Like inclusion for sure is a big part of the progress that's been made 
you know, um, there was times before, even when I first started, um, because at first, you know, autism wasn't, uh, it was sort of new. Do you know what I mean? Like it was just sort of new and they didn't really know. And then as, as time went on and they started to gain and they started to see and they did more testing and you know, you have like, because it's behavior too. Yeah, yeah. And um, a lot of times, you know, when you have behavior, a lot of times they remove that behavior because yeah, it's exactly. disrupting everybody else. Yeah, yeah. But now it, that's not what it's doing because every child has some kind of behavior. Challenges, so let's like, yeah. like, right? Like it yeah. doesn't matter. It can be an A, you know, A line, a stream, regular streaming child that can have behavior issues. So yeah. what they've done is definitely um, keeping them all together, you know, having them accept each other and, and the differences. And like you said, like um, all children bring a different um, exactly. aspect yeah. to it and they help other children go. They help the other children that are there be more compassionate, more understanding, yeah. um, more patient. Yeah. You know, and, and, and not in sympathizing with them, but yeah. in empathy and wanting yeah. to guide them. And um, I think that by having them included in the classrooms, you know, especially like in the last four or five years, it's made a big difference in the step towards um, the growth that these children have and what they have to bring. But that was a process too. Because, it was a process. Yeah, because initially... We don't even want to talk about it. You know, these problem no, kids yeah. put them in the back of the class and take them out of school. Yeah. And then they said, no, we need to add, maybe try to train them, educate them separately. That wasn't a good idea No, because either. then you're segregating them and you're yeah. putting them all, to, all there. And, you know, lots of times, um, you know, they need influences from other people, other yeah. children, in yeah. order to make their growth more possible, right? Yeah. So, and helping them understand, and I don't know, I'm just so glad that it has come to where it has come to today. Yeah, and still got further to go. Oh, it's got, oh yeah, yeah. there's there's lots, there's further to go. And, uh, with autism, it can be difficult at times, because like I said, there's it's such a broad spectrum. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but for, for the most part, it's... Is there different degrees of oh, it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. More so, so than ADHD, mostly? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Because yeah. you can be... Uh, sometimes children with, you know, high level of ADHD can yeah. be on the spectrum, the autism yeah. spectrum. Yeah. And then, like I said, you can get to fully non-functioning, you know, not verbal. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. So it, it, it is quite, quite grand, but they are doing behavior intervention. Yeah. And different means to, you know, to help them and to help them be part of society. To Including help them medication be... or is that part of it? Or? I think with some, but that yeah. becomes down to personal choice. Yeah. It becomes down to family choices. Yeah, because a lot of times... Um, they... It just depends on the behavior once yeah. again, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I know that there's different people. And, you in... know, there's the mental health aspects that are involved in there as well. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's quite diverse. Um, but... Being diagnosed and being able to have those supports at a young age is is critical. Is right? critical. You and the it same is. applies to ADHD. It's critical. So the uh, for our book, you know, so uh, on ADHD, we found a number of people that from all different groups, some of them extremely successful, that learned it at an early age, mainly on the ADHD side, and uh, and and became immensely successful, and then. Uh, so we had one that uh, we thought, I, my understanding was uh, Richard Bronson, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from Virgin Airlines and yes. everything, multi-billionaire, you know, that he was ADHD. So we sent him uh, an, an email or a letter of some sort and, uh, and, and a copy of the book uh, that we were going to do, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the idea of the book in terms of... Uh, on ADHD and a copy of this book. And uh, so we didn't hear, barely hear back from them. It was just kind of, let's see what happens mm -hmm. here. Because we, so then we talked to him about the book, I think. Anyway, he got back to us oh. and he said he wanted to see a copy of the book. Oh, and wonderful. then he said, Richard doesn't have ADHD, he is dyslectic. Oh, okay. I yeah. said, okay. well. Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> he wanted to see the book, and uh, you know he wants to read the book, and, yeah. and uh, 
you know, sitting on his island there on, on wherever that is. And, yes. uh, you know, so I, I follow him if I see an article on, on him. And, uh, but again, making the point that, uh, you know, that a lot of people that have been very, very successful in life have, uh, you know, uh, affected by dyslexia or, um, uh, you know, all the different things and are doing very, very well, uh, you know, being successful in whatever they are pursuing, you know. Absolutely. And, and that is, and, but the key is, again, and that's what we're trying to capture in our book, uh, you know, the uh, ADHD Unlocked. Mm -hmm. Talking about the different individuals that have had different experience as it applies to ADHD and how have they gone how have they managed through the process? And the common denominator in most cases, virtually in all, is that early diagnosis. Yeah. And then exposure to somebody that knew uh, and, and was knowledgeable and not looking at it as something that is fixable or something that has to be repaired or suppressed in some form or fashion. Yes, and that is the key. And, and I found this one individual that uh, at one point, uh, you know, we had a meeting about, uh, you know, somebody that was an engineer or architect or whatever he was, and we were looking at, uh, uh, they were working on a proposal of some sort and we were reviewing it and uh, then that went fairly quickly. He was very good at what he was doing. And, uh, you know, then we started talking in a general sense and he somehow knew that I wrote a book about it and then I started talking to him about ADHD and while we were sitting there the guy physically changed mm -hmm. because he must have been in his 50s okay. he was ADHD yeah but had not talked about it and then he started talking about it that uh, you know the he was getting counseling mm -hmm. for it and that uh, him and his wife had to had some challenges between them, not bad ones that they're leaving each other, anything like that, but mm -hmm. uh, he had uh, medication that he got and trying to, uh, uh, you know, help the process. And then, uh, but it had happened, he said he was still going to counseling, but the challenges they were having currently is that he decided that at one point to take the medication and flush it down the toilet because he didn't like it. <laughs> and his wife got angry about it because he said, how can you do that? Do that. Be trying, trying to... to fix it. You know, and what you're trying to do is, you know, you're flushing all the, the medication down, obviously not understood, yes. right? And, yeah. uh, you know, but the guy afterwards meeting with him and talking to him about it, the way it, I look at it as a superpower, mm -hmm. is that uh, uh, not so much that I made so much an impression on him, other than the circumstance was so recent to him and, and familiar. And familiar, mm -hmm. and obviously mm -hmm. I was going to write about it, that uh, it, it really, really affected him, that when he left, he was a different guy. Oh, that's know? great. Yeah, yeah, and that's and great. that's and that that's the difference, right? It's yeah. not about fixing. You don't want to fix them. You want to use your superpower to enable them to be the best that they can be at whatever they want to be. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, and and immensely rewarding in terms of uh, you know the uh, seeing this all evolve, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's wonderful. So how do you see it for yourself? Uh, you know, I know about your uh, marathon. You probably mm -hmm. keep running as a as a hobby. You don't smoke anymore, so that's yep. a good thing. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, so uh, you know, so how do you see things going forward for you in terms of uh, you know, obviously having this? Uh, uh, I, I can see where you really enjoy in a way of working with uh, children in particular that are challenged. And, and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just, I'm gonna maintain doing that. Yeah. And um, I'm also, um, like I said, I'm fostering and trying to grow, working hard at growing my own running coaching business. And um, I'm now part of, I've sit on the board of the Prince George Roadrunners. 
Yeah, I see a, that. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, which is a local, our local community running group, and um, which you have so generously sponsored us this year. Thank you very much. Yes. And yeah, so, you know, I'm spending my time doing that too. I'm enjoying volunteering and, and being able to give back to the, to, to running in that, in that way. Yeah. 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 And so, inspiring others. Inspiring right? others. And, um, yeah, like it's, it's a great organization. It's the only one here in Prince George and it's a non How many members, uh, uh, so board members, we have our board members, but right now, so we offer, what we do is, um, full memberships and, um, half memberships okay and at this point for sign up for this year we are already at 80 members for full well wow. um and i think in the 60s for half um it's so wonderful now because we have in-person racing so it's yeah. back so we're able to offer the in-person racing but also we're going to have the the virtual aspect as well for people that just aren't ready to get out there and start so how does the virtual look the virtual looks the same. You basically register and you're doing it on your own. So you're, you're going out, you're um, running whatever race yeah. it is. So we have sanctioned races this year. So first of all, yeah. like this Sunday coming up is our Heights Fiber, okay. five kilometers or um, five miles. Yeah. And so you can choose to um, do it virtually. So you just go out on your own, run your own route, whatever, yeah. post it, and it gets put towards your, towards your membership or you can do it in, as an in-person race as well, yeah. right? So the whole objective of Roadrunners is to bring like-minded individuals yes, together. Absolutely, bring, bring the running community together. Yeah. And it doesn't matter, like whether you run once in a while or you're yeah. a marathon runner, there's, yeah. there's no description. It's yeah. open to absolutely everybody. We have um, weekly run groups, and yeah. then if there's ever any clinics that come available, um, we have memberships, so the membership, the full memberships are um, a hundred dollars. Yeah, and they incorporate having um, your BC Athletics. So you're a member of the BC Athletics. Yeah, and then you get complimentary entry into the in-person races that we have. Um, you get your T-shirt, your yeah. swag T-shirt, and your medal. Yeah. And of course there's insurance, sports and injury insurance and liability that, that comes with it. And then we also have the, um, the half membership, which is $60 and that's everything but the complimentary entry into all the, into the races. Right. Yeah. So, so what would the, the, so if somebody becomes a member, mm -hmm. would that be individuals? Is there an age or there's any? no age, there's yeah. no weight, there's no, no limit. There's, there's nothing. It's just, to have an inclusive, running, fun group of like-minded individuals. And that fun is the fun is critical the, oh, part, right? Fun is critical. Actually, our yeah. series are all called fun series. Yeah. Um, it's running for fun. It's, yeah, there's no trying to keep up to this person or feeling, you know, intimidated. Like, is we it, want to welcome everybody. Is it an introduction to easy becoming used to running as part of your lifestyle? Absolutely, because yeah. you can come in and join. Like there's um, Tuesdays and or sorry Wednesdays and Thursdays. Okay. There's uh, like a run group that gets out and runs. So where would that be? Uh, give me an example of that. Uh, uh, they usually meet at the aquatic center, and yeah. then they'll have that one of the where? members. Uh, the aquatic center down on um, oh gosh, the Proxy. Prince George Aquatic Center. It's next to the uh, CN Center. Oh yeah. 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 So yeah, we yeah. meet in the parking lot there yeah, yeah. and then we, you know, go out and run together. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we welcome all members yeah. to come out and run and, and all people, anybody that wants to, you don't even necessarily have to, yeah, be a because, member. You can uh, come out and run with us because you don't have to just be a member. Yeah. So, so what it kind of would be is that saying, uh, you know, I, I'm not running because I got in a uh, uh, knee replacement uh, and, uh, and I do other things, but for people that uh, running is a bit intimidating because yes. I see a lot of people that are so good at it and they run marathons, but am I going to, not me, but somebody in general watching that may be aspiring to kind of trying it, that would be the way to go, right? Yes. Start there and then kind of get a feel of it. Get a and feel of it. Everybody is encouraging you if you try. Absolutely. If, if it doesn't quite go the way you had hoped it would, there is always lots of support to kind of gradually bring you forward to whatever you want to be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and that's the nice thing about running. It's, yeah. I mean, I know it's individual. Yeah. It's an individual sport, but 
really you're just striving to be the best runner that you can be, the best runner John can be, the best yeah. runner Mattia can be. We're not yeah. all going to be the same, no. No. but we all have uh, different, you know, distinctions to what we can do or what, you know, where we can go with it. Yeah. And, you know, some people only like running once a week. Yeah. Some people want to run every single day. Some people, yeah. you know, it just, and that, that's the nice thing. But there is a lot, like Prince George has a big running community. Yeah. So it's a nice way for, because it can be lonely too. So it's nice to have people that you can run with. Well, exactly. Right? And people yeah. that are supporting each other and even on the roads and the trails. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So the, uh, yeah, it's just very, very interesting, uh, you know, the, uh, so, uh, so, where do you go from here other than the... I'm just going to keep plugging away. I love, I love marathon running. I, yeah. my, my goal, yeah. my long-term goal is to complete all six. All six. All six. Yeah. I'm giving myself till 65. Yeah. I'm 53. So, 52. Oh, wow. My husband always adjusts me a year, so oh, I wow. get used to him saying that. Amazing. And I, yeah, I want, I want to just keep running. I want to... Um, you know, retire and spend my Your life husband traveling. Supportive. My husband, oh yeah, my family is incredibly supportive. Yeah. I, there's very, no way I could do what I do without my family. Very important, right? My husband is my number one fan. Yeah. And he's at every start and every finish. Sweet. Yeah. And yeah, um, yeah I couldn't do. I, there's no way you can't do it. You can't no. take away that much time from your family. No. And and they support me, and they know how much I love it, and. Yeah. I don't know. It just makes you feel whole when you're doing something yeah. that... No question about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and encouraging others. Thank you for being thank my you, guest. Thank you, John. It's my pleasure. Yeah. Always. Good luck. Always. Yes, yeah. thank you.